Hi, my name is Mr. Robert and I'm the library teacher at Roxville Elementary School and Highland Park Elementary School here in West Seattle. And today I'm going to be joined by a friend and colleague of mine and her name is Miss Wilson. And Miss Wilson is a second grade teacher at Kimball Elementary School on Beacon Hill. And today Miss Wilson and I are going to get together with all you second and third graders and your families. Miss Wilson is going to do a read aloud with you today. She's going to teach you a math game. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to do some movement with you. And then at the end, Miss Wilson and I are going to get together and she and I are going to talk about math with all of you. It's been a few weeks now that we haven't been going to school. And I've been thinking a lot about how I've been feeling here at home. And when I think about feelings, I like to use the mood meter. Now, those of you who use the mood meter in your class, you know that when you're in the yellow, you have high energy and you're in a good mood. You're in a pleasant mood. When you're in the red, you have high energy, but you're in an unpleasant mood. You're in a bad mood. When you're in the green, you have low energy, but you're in a pleasant mood. You're in a good mood. And when you're in the blue, you have low energy and you're in an unpleasant mood. And I have to tell you, the past few weeks, I've been spending a lot of time here in the blue. It's been kind of a scary and sad time for me, and I think probably for a lot of you. I haven't been able to do the things that I'm used to doing. I haven't been able to see the people that I'm used to seeing all the time. And when I go out, I've got to keep six feet away from people, and that makes me feel a little scary, a little scared, <laughs> and a little sad, and that puts me in the blue. But you know what will put me in the green? is if I do something that I'm used to doing and something that I like doing. And one of the things that I love doing is I love teaching and I love spending time with kids. So I have a feeling that today during this lesson that I am going to be in the green. I'm going to be in the green when I'm with you today. And I can't speak for Miss Wilson, but I have a feeling that she too is going to be in the green. We both are going to have kind of low energy, but we're going to be in a good, good mood. Miss Wilson, it's your turn. Mr. Robert, it's so great to work with you again. You're absolutely right, I am in the green. I'm really happy to be doing today's math lesson. I've really missed school, especially all my students in B3 at Kimball Elementary. Hi. I hope today's math lesson reminds you a little bit of being at school, just the way it reminds me of being a teacher. Today's math lesson focus on perseverance. Mathematicians persevere in solving problems. Last week, Mr. Stack from Highland Park taught us what persevere means. It means to use our mind and body to solve problems and work through challenges. I'd like to add on a little bit to Mr. Stack's definition and say it's when we continue to use our mind and body to work through challenges even with little success. Learning is hard and sometimes takes a really long time. Today's read aloud features a student who took a long time but persevered in her learning. This book is called The Oldest Student, How Mary Walker Learned to Read. It's a true story about a woman born into slavery enslaved people were not allowed to read or write. But in this story, we'll learn how Mary Walker persevered in her dream of reading. Let's begin. Whenever young Mary Walker was tired, she would shield her eyes from the sun and watch the swallow-tailed kites dip and soar above the trees. That must be what it's like to be free, she thought. But Mary didn't watch for long. Even at only eight years old, she knew the first rule of the Union Springs, Alabama plantation she lived on, keep working. She knew the second rule too. Slaves should not be taught to read or write or do anything that might help them learn to do so. Mary didn't stop working. She didn't learn to read either, 
But at the end of each long day, picking cotton, toting water to Papa and the other slaves who chopped wood for the train tracks, or helping Mama clean the big house, she would lie in her little bed next to the crumbling fireplace and think about those birds. When I'm free, I'll go where I want and rest when I want, and I'll learn to read too. When she was 15, it happened. Mary and her mother, brothers, and sisters were free. The Emancipation Proclamation said so. What it didn't say was how a family with nothing except the tattered garments on their backs could find food, clothes, and a place to sleep. Mary's father had died and the family was on its own. Freedom Road to Freedom Road. Across fields and through woods, ex-slaves surged like waves crashing hard to shore. Now that they were free, every road was freedom road. Many headed north and west and every which way, searching for long lost family members or simply experiencing the wonder of being free. Others like Mary chose to stay in the South. An organization called the Freedmen's Bureau helped those who stayed to find shelter on abandoned Confederate land. Mary and her family settled in a one-room cabin, and for the next few years, she worked alongside her mama to help feed her siblings. Seven days a week, she churned butter, cleaned houses, and cared for other folks' children. The hours were long, and if Mary was thirsty or hungry or needed to use the outhouse, she had to wait until she got home. At week's end, she would offer mama the one lonely quarter she had earned. One day, Mary met a group of evangelists on the roadside. A woman with soft wrinkles in her kindly face placed a big, beautiful Bible in Mary's hands and told her, your civil rights are in these pages. Mary didn't know what civil rights were. She only knew that top to bottom, front to back, that book was filled with words. I'm going to learn to read those words, she vowed. But not today. Today, there was work to be done. And tomorrow too. When Mary got married, she and her husband worked as sharecroppers, renting someone else's house, using someone else's tools, and planting someone else's seeds to farm land they would never own. After they harvested the crops, almost all the money they earned went to pay for the housing, two, tools, and seed cost. Mary was 20 years old when her first son was born. She opened her Bible and marveled at the squiggles inside. There had been no time to learn to read. A friend wrote Mary's son's birth date in the Bible, August 26, 1869. Then Mary dipped a pen into the inkwell and made her mark beside it. Not a letter, not a name, just a mark. It was the best she could do. Throughout the years, Mary had three more children and she continued to work very hard to provide for her family. She continued to go to church and look in her Bible, but still unable to read it. The years passed. When Mary was well past 90, she and her husband sat in their creaky rockers while one or another of their sons read to them. After the two younger boys died, the eldest read. Then Mary's husband died. Several years later, her eldest son died too. He was 94. Mary had outlived her entire family. She was 114 years old and alone. Can't read, she said, can't write. I don't know anything. Mary stood at the window of her retirement home and gazed down at the world below. Words were everywhere, on billboards, on buildings, on store windows and trucks. She sighed. <sighs> All this time, she thought, and they still look like squiggles. Mary had heard about a new reading class held in her building. She pursed her lips. 
No more waiting, she decided. Time to learn. Out of her apartment, into an elevator, and down to the lobby she went. When the elevator doors sprang open, Mary saw people sitting under a sign with a picture of an open book. She could not read the words. A neighbor walked up to her. That's a reading class, Miss Mary. Can I help you over? Mary shook her head. Then she gripped her cane, lifted her chin, and walked straight mm. toward that sign. For the next year and more, Mary put everything she had into learning to read. It wasn't easy after all. She was the oldest student in the class and probably in the entire country. Could someone her age learn to read? She didn't know, but by God, she was going to try. She studied the alphabet until her eyes watered. She memorized the sounds each letter made and practiced writing her name so many times that her fingers cramped. She learned to recognize sight words and then challenged herself to make short sentences with them. She studied and studied until books and pages and letters and words swirled in her head while she slept. One fine day, Mary's hard work paid off. She could read. Word of her accomplishment traveled and people everywhere celebrated with her. Chattanooga's mayor, newspaper journalists across the country, and a man from the US Department of Education who said, Miss Mary Walker, I pronounce you the nation's oldest student. All shared her joy. Mary felt complete. She still missed her sons, but whenever she was lonely, she would read from her Bible or looked out her window and read the words in the street below. From then on, Chattanoogans honored Mary's achievement with a yearly birthday party. In 1966, President Lyndon B. Johnson sent well wishes on Mary's 118th birthday. And in 1969, President Richard Nixon did the same. Mary was now 121 years old. Mary received many gifts over the years. A radio, a sofa, her very first television, a new Bible, the key to the city, and perfume and champagne from the Canadian mountains. She also received something that brought back those long days in the Alabama cotton fields, her first plane ride. From the cockpit window, Mary gazed at the trees and rooftops below. No different than a horse and buggy ride, she joked, but she knew it was. As the airplane dipped and soared like those swallow-tailed kites of long ago, Mary decided that flying was a lot like reading. They both made a body feel as free as a bird. Each year before her birthday celebration came to an end, someone would whisper, let's listen to Miss Mary. The shuffling and movement would fade away until not a sound was heard. Then Mary would stand on her old, old legs, clear her old, old throat, and read from her Bible or her school book in a voice that was clear and strong. When she finished, she would gently close her book and say, you're never too old to learn. And that is the story of how Mary Walker persevered. Each of you are persevering too. These times are difficult and uncertain, and still we continue to use our mind and body to work through the challenges that life presents. Just like Mary Walker, I'm super proud of each of you. Now, let's head into our math game. And we're back for our math game. Joining me is my friend, Mr. David. Hello. We're going to play a math game called Pig, and you will definitely need to persevere to count in this game. For materials, you will need a dice, a pencil, and paper. I'm using my whiteboard and marker, but you can use pencil and paper. Now, if you don't have a dice, do not worry. You can make your own number generator by folding up little pieces of paper, 
that you've written the numbers one, two, three, four, five, or six on. And then you put them in a container or jar, shake, and pull them out. That way you get a number randomly, just like you would if you had a dice. Now, the game is called Pig. We are trying to get to 100 points by adding up our different turns. Let's see who goes first. Why don't we Rochambeau for it? Excellent idea. Rochambeau, go. Woo, all right. So I'm going to go first. When I roll my dice or pull a number out of the bet of the container, I get to roll as many times as I want if I get the numbers two, three, four, five, or six. I got the number three. So I'm going to put that in my bank. One way to keep track is to write each roll you get. Because I got the number three, I can decide if I wanna end my turn and keep my points or roll again to try and earn more. I'm gonna roll again. I got a four. So I'm gonna add that to the three I already have. Now, be careful. If you roll the number one, all your points get erased. The bank collects all the money. But if you roll another two, you get to keep it. So I'm gonna roll again. I'm gonna take a chance because I wanna get as many points as I can. Good luck. <gasps> oh, <laughs> I got a one. So that means the three and four I had in my bank go away and I have zero again. Your turn, Mr. David. Okay. For my first roll, I got a two. Now I'm gonna add the numbers in my head before writing them down at the end of the round. For my second roll, I got a one. Uh-oh. No points for either of this on our first turns. <laughs> Let's try again. Five. I'm going to write mine down to help me keep track. <gasps> Six. Now I'm getting nervous. Last time when I rolled three, I got a one and lost my points. So I think I might stop here. Now I get to add up and see what's in my bank. If I go five plus six, I know that five plus five is 10, plus one more is 11. So now in my bank, I have 11 points. Okay, for my first roll, I got a two. I'm gonna roll again. Three, so two plus three equals five. I'm gonna roll one more time. Three. So five plus three equals eight. I'm going to stop there and that'll be my turn. Can I ask why you stopped at this row? You got a three, which isn't very close to one. No, but each time you roll is another chance to get a one. And if you don't bank your points, you lose them. Mm hmm. Interesting strategy. Okay. So right now, Mr. David has eight and I have 11. Now, if I roll them this turn and I get a one, that just means that I have no points for this turn. I don't lose the points that are already in my bank. Four, keeping track, I would now be adding this four to the 11. Another four. I'm going to keep my strategy of only rolling twice. So now I have four plus four, which equals eight. And I'm going to add that eight to the 11 that I already have. That equals 19. I now have 19 points. 19. All right. Okay. I'm gonna to try to catch up for my first roll. 
I got a two. I'm gonna roll again. I got a second two, so two plus two equals four. I'm going to roll again. Six, so two plus two equals four, plus six equals 10. I'm gonna go one more time Whoa. because I need to catch up. Another six. Wow. So that gets me to 10 plus six, which equals 16. Now, Mr. David kept all of that in his head, adding up as he went. Find out what strategy works for you when you add. Do you like to keep all your rolls on paper or are you adding them up in your head? So in my last round, I got eight points plus the 16 I got in this round means 16 plus eight, which equals 24. Nice job. For additional challenges, you can add to a higher number like 200 or 500, or you can add an additional dice. So you would roll two dice at once. See what challenges you and your family can come up with. Now, we will be heading to Mr. Robert for a movement break. Get ready to have your hearts pumping. Hi there. I told you that when we do this lesson, I was probably gonna be in the green, low energy and in a good mood, and I'm still in a good mood, but my energy level is about to get high because we're gonna do some movement together. As I was thinking about what kind of movement we're gonna do, I went back and I was looking at the story that Miss Wilson was reading, the oldest student. And here on the first page, it says, whenever young Mary Walker was tired, she would shield her eyes from the sun and watch the swallow-tailed kites dip and soar above the trees. The kites are those birds that you see. That must be what it's like to be free, she thought. So, you know what we're going to do today? We're going to dip and we're going to soar and we're going to fly like the kites. Stand up. It's time for us to do some movement. And we're going to flap our wings like the kites. And every time we flap, we're going to count by twos and we're going to flap our wings up to 30. Remember, you can dip. Dip means you go down low or you can soar. Soar means you fly up high. Are you ready? Here we go. Counting by twos. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-four, twenty-six, twenty-eight, thirty. Good job. Hi, everybody. It's good to be back with you. Hi, Miss Wilson. Hi, Mr. Robert. Great movement break again. Oh, I hope you had fun. Did you get into the yellow or were you in the green? I was definitely in the yellow. Excellent. What do you have there? This is an image from the book we just read, The Oldest Student. I thought we could use the image in the book today to do a little math counting. Sounds good. So in this image, there are four different buildings, and each building has a different number of windows. I'm wondering, how many windows do you see in this building here? Well, I see three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen windows in that building. Wow, how did you count those eighteen windows? Well, I counted by threes. I could see that there were, they were all grouped in threes. And there were six groups of three. So I just counted threes six times. Three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18. 18 windows. Wow. How many do you get? I also got 18, but I counted a different way. I know that there are three, six, nine windows on this side. And this side also has nine. So if I do my doubles, nine plus nine, I also get 18. 
It doesn't matter which way we do it, though. No, that's the Still great the same thing answer. about adding. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you at home, how do you count the windows in this building? Hmm. Moving to this shop building, Mr. Robert, how many uh -huh. windows do you count here? Well, I count 10 plus 8 equals 18. Wow, where did you see the 10? I saw the 10, uh, the windows that are above the S. Mm. I saw that they were in groups of two, and I saw that there were five groups of two, so I automatically saw two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. And then on the other side, I also saw groups of two, but I saw only eight. I saw two, four, six, eight. So then I just had to add 10 plus eight, and I got 18. Wow. I could count by fours, but I noticed if I count by fours, it wouldn't be even. So maybe I'll go back and count by twos. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Wow, these buildings have the same number of windows, but they don't look the same at all. At all, they do not look alike at all. Do you have a different way of counting the windows in this building too? If you can find a different way at home, tell your family. I challenge you to find different ways of counting the number of windows in the first and last buildings as well. As a challenge, see if you can write three different equations for the different windows in the building. You can also try counting the windows in your neighborhood. That's all for our math talk today. Mr. Obey, it's what? been great having you with me. This has been fun and challenging doing this Zoom meeting, but we did it. We did do it. And I hope we get to do it again soon. You, you know what? We persevered. We did persevere. We continued through a challenge, even if we didn't have success the first time. Yeah. Oh, Miss Wilson, will we be back in a couple of days? Will I see you in a couple of days? Yes, we will. We'll have a new math read aloud and a new movement break as well. Take care, everybody. See you next time.